note that this session is being recorded and will be posted to the Community Board 3 Facebook page and website. Finally, I would like to acknowledge Richard Bierak, the Land Use Director for Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who has joined us this evening as an observer. So that concludes my opening remarks. I guess we can move on. Um, Mr. Butler. You're muted, Mr. Butler. Next on the agenda uh, was Councilman Coney, but I don't see him on as of yet. So what we're going to do is do you want to go into your presentation? Yeah, I could start that. Uh, do we know if Mr. Jones is able to speak? So he said he can um, he can hear everything. It's just that you guys can't hear him. And he dialed into the number on the panel on the flyer. I'm sorry. Let me see something. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so is, he's responding in the chat now, but uh, I don't know why we can't hear him. Is that him on the phone? Yeah, he's calling in from that 212 number I sent you. Um, he just yeah, has. Is there like another? Back, it's like we Sorry. hear the background noise, but I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on. We hear his background noise, but I don't know why he's, he's not speaking. So, yeah. Well, Ms. Falero, will you be able to present on behalf of the Department of Buildings? I mean, yeah, I can answer some of the questions for sure. It's just that he's from the, you know, he's an expert on this particular um, issue because he's uh, the chief of the plumbing enforcement unit. So, um, you know, we really wanted to have his expertise. A lot of the, the questions, especially that you answered, uh, uh, asked. Um, well, we're going to so continue to try to get him on. So in the meantime, um, who can work on that, Mr. Butler or Mr. Buser? I'll, I'll give him a call. I'll have to find out what's going on. I don't know. Okay, I'll so in the meantime... Let me just put up the presentation. Yeah, you can start that. Um, okay. That you're, if you can go to the beginning, that's page five. That's in the middle. Okay, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to just try to give um, the context for how this came about, how we got to this point, and uh, talk about a couple of other laws that are causing a lot of confusion. And then uh, finally, I'll give you some of the bare bones information about Local Law 152, and then the uh, Buildings Department's going to dive in and give a lot more detail. So if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So how do we get to this point? Um, many of you may remember that there were uh, two major explosions that took place, one in 2014 in East Harlem, and then there was another uh, gas-related explosion in 2015 in the East Village. As a result of those two calamities, there were at least three different laws that were put into place and uh, uh, various regulations that are being implemented now. Um, next slide, please. So the East Harlem explosion, um, took place March 12, 2014, 
1644 and 1646 Park Avenue, near 100, East 116th Street. There were eight people killed, 70 people injured, 100 families left displaced. Next, next slide, please. Then, a little more than a year later, there was an explosion on the Lower East Side. Um, the explosion, the gas explosion took place at 121 Second Avenue between East 7th Street and St. Mark's Place. It resulted in two deaths, 19 injured, and a fire that completely destroyed uh, two other buildings, so 119, uh, 121, where the explosion took place, and 123 Second Avenue in Manhattan. Next slide, please. As a result of those two explosions, um, these three different laws or regulations were put in place. So, first one I'm going to mention. And it's important to, to know about these three because there's a lot of confusion out there about um, what's happening, whether inspections are free, whether you have to have a licensed plumber, et cetera, et cetera. So I think by explaining these three different regulations, you'll be able to sort out in your mind um, the differences and, and we'll be able to focus on local law 152. So the first one is New York State Public Service Commission Case order number 15-G-0244. That is a service line inspection program. Um, the, uh, the gas service line from the point of entry to a building to the meter uh, must now be inspected. In this case, the compliance mandate falls on the utility company. In Brooklyn, um, that company would be National Grid. So they're responsible for inspecting the gas lines from the point of entry into a building to the, to the meter. So it's a very restricted inspection. In Brooklyn, National Grid has subcontracted out that inspection to a private contractor and that contractor is Precision Pipeline Solutions. So that one, again, the mandate falls on the utility company. Next slide, please. Okay, the second law that came about, Local Law 30. So the first one is a state body. This law, Local Law 30, was enacted by the city council signed into law by the mayor. This required utility companies to install shutoff valves in the street to ensure that gas can be shut off by first responders in the event of an emergency. In this case, as with that New York State um, Public Service Commission law or regulation, the compliance mandate falls on the utility company. So once again, Local Law 30, that would be the responsibility of National Grid in Brooklyn. Um, and in Brooklyn, National Grid has subcontracted out the work of doing the valve installations to three companies, Howland Construction, Eleanor Hawkeye, and Safeway Construction. In Community Board 3, it seems to be primarily Howland Construction that is doing that work for Local Law 30, uh, installing the shutoff valves, and they seem to be almost finished with that work. Next slide, please. So this is really the main subject of the meeting tonight, and that's Local Law 152 of 2016. Um, so it was passed again by the city council, signed into law by the mayor, and a lot of people forgot about it. So, uh, effective January 1st, 2020, gas piping systems 
in all buildings, except for buildings classified in the occupancy group R3, must be inspected by a licensed master plumber. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time just unpacking that first bullet and buildings department will get into a lot of details about what's exempt, what does R3 mean, um, et cetera. Okay, now in this case, different from the first two, in this case, compliance, the compliance mandate falls on the property owner. So all of you out there watching this, you're responsible for this one, okay? Failure to file an inspection cert certification before the applicable due date may result in a civil penalty of $10,000. The deadline is based on what community board that you're in. We're in community board three. All community board threes throughout the city have a deadline of compliance of December 31st, 2020. So we're sounding the alarm. There's a compliance deadline of the end of this year. And if you don't comply, you could face a fine of up to $10,000. So that's just uh, kind of a bare outline of local law 152. And um, I think at this point, um, we're gonna move on to the buildings department. They're gonna drill down on this law. Um, unless, is council member Cornegie on? I don't know if he wants to give some remarks. At this point. I'm gonna come back a little bit later. I'm gonna come back. There's a lot of noise in the background. I don't know, somebody, hello? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I don't know who who is that. Well, there's a lot of noise. I don't know if people can mute themselves if you're not speaking. Okay, so there's a series of um, questions that we've um, compiled and we'll get to. Um, but first, we're going to have the. the Maris, uh, that seems to be you. Me? I had yeah. myself muted. No, nah, you weren't. No, nah, you weren't. Okay, so first we're going to, is. do we know if Council Member Carnegie is on? If I don't see him, I'll check the attendee side. Okay, or well, if anybody from his office, I don't know if they want to give any brief remarks, and then after that we're going to move on to the meat of this, which is going to be the buildings department since they regulate. Um, but no one from his office is on. Okay, so if not, are we able to get are we able to get Mr. Jones on? We're we gonna hear from Ms. Uh, Falero. What we do is start off we start off with Damaris while I search for Mr. Jones. Okay, so we're gonna have next uh, from the Department of Buildings of the City of New York, Damaris Falero. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Clearly? Good? Okay, great. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go down the list of questions. Um, I mean, right now we're trying to get in touch with Mr. Sean Jones, which uh, is the chief of the plumbing enforcement unit. Um, I don't know what's going on, but I'll try to answer the questions uh, to the best of my ability. Um, I'm not the obviously the expert, but I, I definitely will uh, try to answer the best of my ability. Anything that I can't answer, obviously, I will look can, into. Can you start with an overview of, you know, give a little bit more detail about Local Law 152, like the deadlines and um, who has to do the inspection? Can you just give us a little more basic information about Local Law 152? Yes. So Local Law 152, so basically um, effective this year, January 1st, 2020, gas piping systems in all buildings, except for um, buildings classified in occupancy group R3, <clears throat> excuse me, must be inspected by a licensed master plumber um, or a qualified individual working under the direct and continuing supervision of a licensed master plumber. Um, and then these inspections must happen at least uh, once every four years. Um, and that's according to the schedule set out by the uh, one RCNY. Um, 
there is a link that's provided. I can uh, give you, and I can give you that. Um, it's, a, it's also provided on the service notice that we handed out to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a licensed master plumber, and you know, for homeowners out there that don't know, this happens a lot actually, whether the person that they've hired is actually a licensed master plumber or not, um, they can actually check that on our website. So let's say they hire, you know, Joe's plumbing company and they want to make sure that the plumbing company is actually licensed. There's a link. They can go to our website, the building's um, information system, type in the license, the license master plumber's uh, name or building company, and then they can check out their actual credentials. They can see if they are licensed or not. So a lot of the times, um, you know, plumbers will basically start to uh, will say that they are licensed when they're really not. And, you know, um, you, you can come into a lot of issues that way. It has to be a licensed master plumber um, doing these sort of uh, inspections. Um, other than um, so as far as the buildings that are exempt, um, so those are the are uh, as of as of October, actually, it's one or two family homes in community boards one three and ten in all boroughs and um the occupancy r3 is actually condos or residential units in one to three story buildings um and now i'm going to actually these are a lot of this is actually in the questions that you that you listed so if you don't mind i'll just run down the questions um so the first question was, has NYC done any outreach to inform property owners about local law 152? So uh, DOB has notified the public via building news and via service notices that we share with our uh, networks. That includes the elected officials and the community boards. Um, so that's really the only form of outreach that we've done on this local law. Um, obviously, as you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's no physical outreach that has been done. Um, this is all sort of um, been done by services notice, notice service notices primarily. Okay, um, okay, so can I just just take a pause on that point? Um, sure. What is building news? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. When you said it's so, that's just our news. that's our um, newsletter. That's actually found on our website as well. Um, basically, you know, we have a newsletter um, once every week to and, um, inform the public about updates all throughout the agency. Okay. One second, so, one second Mr. Flatso, one second, please. Mr. Jones, can you hear me? Yes, I can, can you hear me? Yes, okay. we got you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Mr. Jones, did you get my, you got my questions or I could just ask them and you could, you could continue, you could, we could work that way too. Yeah, I'm looking at the PowerPoint, so I see the questions that, that's present, being presented. Okay, so just for um, the uh, participants, uh, we were just able to connect <laughs> with the, the head of the plumbing division for the buildings department in Brooklyn. So this is a very important person here. Um, that's Mr. Sean Jones. So he's going to continue uh, going through some of these details now. What what uh, Ms. Falero was referring to in terms of the questions, I sent a series, and we got a lot of background noise. Can, can somebody please mute that? I think it's you, Demar thank you. Okay, so um, what she was referring to was that I sent a series of questions in advance to the buildings department to try to capture what I felt were um, a lot of the concerns with the community. So we just went through the first one and that's in terms of outreach. So I think that's gonna be a major issue because there are a lot of people, particularly senior citizens that may not have access to the internet. So if the main way of notifying people is on the DOB website, and I wasn't even familiar with building news myself, and I'm a fairly, I try to keep up on these things. So, um, you know, I think, we're gonna, that's that's a major issue still, just so, outreach. So, yes, Mr. Jones. So let's see. Let's get to the questions because we have a lot of questions coming in to the to to the chat and on the text messages. Okay, so, so we'll keep we'll keep rolling on the questions. Could you go over the exemption criteria? Because R three for the average person watching this, they're not going to know what that means. I know Ms. Valero just mentioned co-ops, condos, ones, twos. Mr. Jones, 
That is correct. So, but, 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 but let's, let's clear this up. You, you, when we say co-ops and condos, we're looking at buildings that's housed in like what would be like a one or two family structure or a townhouse, so to say. We're not talking about a multi-dwelling building that has more than two, two apartments or two occupancy or two families living in it. So, so to make that concrete, if I'm living in a co-op building that has 50 units, it's not exempt. Correct. Okay, but if I'm in a building that has two co-op units, it's exempt. If it falls under the RC classification, so with a gray area, so if the building is solely a one or two family, then we, we we consider you to be exempt. If there's a mixed use or any other type of occupancy group going on within that property, then you must comply and file with the uh, file your uh, local law one fifty two certifications. Okay, so that was actually one of the questions about uh, mixed use building. So you're saying I had down as a one family plus a store or two family plus a store exempt and the answer is no. That is correct. Okay. Um, how is the, how will the city determine exemptions if a building has no certificate of occupancy? And just let me unpack that for there's a lot of people on this that may not know what the certificate of occupancy is. So could you just explain what is the certificate of occupancy? And the question is, how will the city determine exemptions if a building has no certificate of occupancy. Okay, so certificate of occupancy is basically it's, it's a documentation, official documentation that lets you know what what basically is within that structure. So if you have a one family house, it'll indicate what the cellar consists of, if it's a ballroom and a storage room, if you have um, you know, one family on the first floor or if it's a two story, it'll just indicate that one family dwelling. It wouldn't have any additional information. Now, if you have a, a two family dwelling, you'll have, of course, if the building has, if the property has a cellar, it indicate what the cellar consists of. It indicate if the building has a basement, it indicate that it's part of the family, that maybe the first floor apartment. And then if you have the second floor apartment, if it's a separate, it'll indicate that the second floor occupies an apartment. Okay, so how are you gonna, so, you know, a big challenge in central Brooklyn is that there are a lot of properties built before January 1st, 1938. And that date is important because that's the date that the buildings department started requiring certificates of occupancy. So what are you gonna do or how are you gonna determine exemptions for properties that have no certificate of occupancy? Because a lot of the buildings in, in Bedford-Stuyvesant do not have a certificate of occupancy. So all property, I mean, there, there's, there's documentation that the property owner should should have retained. It has information to tell how many families or what the building, what that property actually consists of. So they would have to provide that type of documentation. A question was to ever be raised as to whether or not the building falls under that under that exemption. They would have to provide documentation to the Department of Buildings proving that the property is actually a one or two family home. Can you give an example of what the documentation would be? That would be a deed, a bill of sale, something of that nature. You know, if a, some sort of legal documentation that indicates what that property consists of. So it would be a deed, bill of sale, um, you know, any, any type of uh, financial documentation, things like that. It might be um, some documentation from the Department of Environmental Protection that shows, you know, the flow of water and things of that nature. It's, it's a lot of different ways of determining this. Um, just the property owner has to be uh, get well involved and, and just do some research and reach out to a few different agencies to obtain information if they, if they have no certificate of occupancy on file with the department. Okay, so I could tell you this also, there are a lot of buildings in central Brooklyn that may have discrepancies between what the Department of Finance has and how the building is actually used. For instance, um, there are people that might be in a two family house it has two kitchens, two bathrooms, et cetera. But finance may have it down as a three family. And I see one person nodding their head. I won't, I won't point out who that person is, but they know who they are. So um, how, do you, how do you resolve that issue? How do you, you know, how do you determine whether somebody gets an exemption, say where the Department of Finance has one thing, but then may not actually be how the house is set up? 
that I'm going to just take some additional research so the property owner can do one or two things. So just, just keep in mind, though, also, is that the Department of Finance uh, classification is based on uh, tax filings. That, that's basically what that information is geared towards. So if your property is, in, is, is listed as a two-family, then you're only supposed to be paying taxes on two-family property. If it's listed, the Department of Finance has you listed as a three-family, but technically you have a two-family, then you're overpaying your taxes and so in, in, in many cases. Okay, but in terms of local law 152, where will that leave people? It sounds like they'll have to take the least risk course, which would be to just comply as if it were a three family, even though it's not. Well, who are they following? Is it the Department of Finance or is it um, the CFO? Which well, one no, no, no. My, my case, Mr. Butler, was where there was no CFO. So I'm saying there's no CFO. But the Department of Finance may have it down as a three, even though it's really a two family. So it's kind of a gray area. That's where I'm trying to get clarification. So so one of the one of the ways that they can try to obtain information is uh, what, what we see is that a lot of these properties, a lot of one or two family homes has very minimum job balance. So when that's the case, what we recommend is that they go to their property profile or they can come to the you know the respective borough office. With the, and, they provide, and, get, and do a block and lot search. So within that block and lot search, they'll be able to obtain information. Like, like, I, like I'm looking at a property right now. This property is considered to be a one family. Now, the Department of Finance classification for this particular location is a B1. This is a one or two family home as for the Department of Finance, but the building classification is a B1. So. If I needed to find out information that well, well, slow needed, down, slow down. I, so when you say the building classification, you're talking about the building classification with the finance. The department, department, the finance right? classifies it as right. correct. Okay. So I would go I would have to go to the different I would go to on, on our web on our web page you have what's called action in in the job balance area. So the actions are letting me know any any work, any anything that took place, any permits that was filed for before 1990. 1990 is again a, 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 a milestone because that's when the bid system was created. So that's when we started keeping electronic records of different properties. So if, the, if any work that was performed before 1990, all that information will be found in the actions tab. So you will have to go to the action tabs, print it out, and then you can look for either a new building application or an alteration that might have come after the new building and that'll help us assist in determining what how many family how many legal families this property is because just because a, a property has let's say two families established right now that doesn't necessarily make that two family a legal establishment or three family four families so to say it doesn't just because it's designed in that manner doesn't mean that it was legally Approved okay. for that. So, so we gotta we're gonna move on, but I think the takeaway I, is I the onus. The, on, the onus is gonna be on the owner to clarify that it's a two family and that is right. Yeah. And that is my question. My question is the Department of Buildings Department is managing the compliance of this law. Well, we, that was the next question. Okay. <laughs> that was the next question. So uh, which agency is going to issue the fine for non-compliance? Is that the Department of Finance or is that the Department of Buildings? The Department of Buildings. Okay. okay so my question is, if the Department of Buildings is going to be the, organ the agency that's going to be monitoring the compliance, I know you're saying that a lot of this is on the owner to make the determination and do the research, et cetera. How will the buildings department, how are they going to determine whether or not you fall into the, the category of inspection and whether or not you are compliant? So from my understanding, there's some sort of database within the department that I'm not I'm not necessarily familiar with as this is not my, you know, I don't normally, you know, research and check so for. I, I think the answer, Ms. Penn, is that in the amount of time we have, unless there's an extension, if there's any question, you're going to have to get the inspection done. That's what I'm hearing. 
it, or, or, or or risk a ten thousand dollar fine. You say that there's a database um, that's available, and I, I just want to put out there that HPD, for instance, notifies all of their homeowners of 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 laws, rules, regulations that they must comply to, and deadlines and make and re reminders. Buildings Department has a, a database, but that database is that database available to homeowners to just go in there? That's what you're going to use. Can I go in that database and I can see whether or not I'm in that database? No, it's not. It's not available to the public. Well, so just so like, I mean, yes, you can you can type in your address. <clears throat> excuse me, on our buildings information system, and it'll tell you what your home is classified as uh, as per the Department of Finance. So they are the ones that determine the building classification. So if you if you are not one of those buildings that are exempt, it'll tell you there, and I can walk you I can walk you through it. It's very user friendly. You just type in your address. And it'll show you exactly what type of building classification. The problem you have. is there are a lot of times there are discrepancies between what the Department of Finance has and what how the building is actually used. And you know, uh, there are a lot of records that I know from experience. You're trying to get those records. You have to physically go into the Department of Buildings for a lot of those records. So for most consumers, they're not going to have the time or the expertise to be researching stuff, you know, half a day or a day in the building department. And half the time, the file may not even be there. Somebody may have, you may have to order something that's in, in the warehouse. So, you know, to no, do the research, right. I completely, it's, I completely understand. Um, and I just wanted to say that we do have a customer service line. So if there's any question about that, please feel free to call the customer service line. They can definitely help you throughout all that with all that yeah, stuff. Uh, you I have don't think the customer service line is going to do research for you in the buildings department. But at any rate, we got a, we got a lot of other questions. Um, a lot of questions. A lot of questions in the chat and on the text messages. Yeah. So we're going to keep going. Um, so uh, is it possible, given that we're in COVID? There seems to be very little outreach that's been done. Uh, you got a whole class of people that would not even have access to the uh, building news, um, which are senior citizens, which may not have access to the internet. So is there any talk about a possible extension? There has been several uh, requests for it, but as of, at this at the moment right now, there is no extension as the law does not allow for it to grant any extensions. Um, what about COVID? I mean, there was a period of time in which these uh, uh, inspections could not be done because the city was shut down. Well, in all honesty, COVID never allowed, uh, never stopped these because these were classified as essential as essential work. So the inspections were actually still ongoing during COVID. Okay, so it sounds like Ms. Penn, this is a political issue. If anything's gonna happen, it would have to be the elected officials, either the mayor or you know, the city council would have to take some action because right now, based on the law, uh the deadline is December thirty first. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to move on. Um, could you just uh, explain who, what party files the certification that the inspection was done? Just clarify that. I know it was probably already stated, but just so people hear it clearly again, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry. What was that question? Uh, okay. Who files the certification? Yes. That the inspection. So the owner is the, the owner is the responsible party for filing the certification. So what happens is. Once the inspection takes place, the licensed master plumber or its authorized representative is going to give the owner a copy of what's called the GPS-1 form. That basically is a breakdown of any any issues that might have been observed or whether or not the inspection is passed and is completed in its, in its entirety. Once they, send, once they get the GPS-1 form and the owner is going to fill out, I mean, the property owner is going to, the licensed contractor is going to fill out what's called the GPS-2 form. The GPS, he'll give the owner the GPS 2 form, a copy of the GPS 2 form. Now, two things can happen. Either 
The owner can go into our web-based portal and enter the GPS true form information as well as upload the actual document, or they can, or they can have their licensed master plumber do it if they're, if they're willing to do so. Okay, so either the owner can upload the information directly or the plumber can file this document. That's correct. The owner is the responsible party for submitting the documentation, though. Okay, so I'm just going to drill down on something because I think it probably went by most of the people. Uh, so you said that um, they could find uh, different conditions, I think, and that has to be reported on the GPS one or two? The one. Okay, so gonna, if a plumber they, gonna, goes the in, GPS one, the GPS one is a detail form. It's going to have more detailed information than the two. The two is just the certification <laughs> that the inspection was performed. It's going to okay. indicate they're going to ask whether or not conditions was found, but you don't list those conditions on the GPS two, only on the one. So if a plumber goes into somebody's house and they find some improper conditions. They have to note that on the form and then that gets submitted to the buildings department. Correct? So, if there's some irregular violations in terms of. Plumbing or unsafe conditions that has to be noted on that. GPS 1, correct? It gets noted on the GPS 1, but the department of buildings does not get the GPS 1. That is the home that is required to be taking the copy of that for 8 years. Okay, so they. That doesn't get reported to the buildings department. Like if they found that somebody doesn't have the right type of hole, say on a stove, does that get reported to the buildings department or not? No, it gets reported to the owner so he can make the correction. The GPS two form, he's just going to indicate that he found conditions, and that additional time might be needed to correct that conditions. But he's not going to okay. list. He's not going to be specific as to the conditions that he found on the GPS two form. Okay. And since you mentioned um, a hose to a stove, um, Richard, um, are they doing inspections inside the units or only in public areas? Only in the public areas. Okay. That, that was a good clarification. Play, the confusion is coming to play. The, the, that the utility company mandates the New York State Public Service Commission mandates and inspect all service piping that comes in. They are required to enter to the, into the property, into the apartments and commercial spaces. Local law 152 does not require that. They are only required to inspect all exposed gas piping and mechanical rooms, public corridors, uh, in the basement area, the meter setup, the gas regulators. They are not required to enter into any tenant space. Okay. And I understand that you're getting a lot of this. A lot of the plumbers are telling you that you have to do this, but that is not the case as far as local law 152. Now, if the plumber is working on the on the public service commission mandate, then yes, they are required to enter every space. Okay. Um, but under that one, under the public service commission mandate. The utility company is paying for that inspection, not the owner. So, all right. So, um, got a question about the penalty next. Um, will the ten thousand dollar non-compliance penalty associated with Local Law One Fifty Two accrue annually until an inspection no. report is filed? Because I've seen, I've seen uh, it written up that it is possible. That somebody can keep getting that ten thousand dollar fine. So, what's your understanding about that? No. So, so, so let's say, for instance, community board three, you're required to file today by by January mm -hmm. one. If you don't file it by uh, December thirty one, if you don't have your filing in by December thirty one, then you're going to get a ten thousand dollar violation. When your cycle comes back around again in four years. If you don't foul again, then you're going to get another $10,000 violation, but you're not going to get a $10,000 violation every single year until you decide to foul. It's okay. only going to receive the violation when your fouling cycle has expired. That's a very important clarification because I've actually seen materials from a licensed master plumber uh, insinuating that uh, a homeowner could get a fine every year, that it could be a you know, rolling continuous fine. Okay, so that's that's important to know. Um, and if you know, if you have some of those documentation, some of those leaflets that's being handed out from these licensees, I please ask that you forward that over to me so I can 
We so you want me to rat them out, then? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want me to drop I mean, a dime? Not, I mean, if not, then, you, you, I mean, your, your constituents are going to be, you know, dealing with unnecessary pay, paying unnecessary fees for work right. that, can, that doesn't need to be performed or a portion of an inspection that's not required to be performed. We don't, we don't want – the intent of this, this law is not for plumbers to, to solicit new business. We want to make sure that these gas systems are installed and, and they're properly and they're safe and these people that's living or working in these buildings are safe. So we don't want customers, you know, or, or contractors, you know, doing shady business and then that's putting people at risk and not willing to file to even verify or allow it. Any so so to come how, in. who would we <laughs> report this to? Is there email or how do we, if we know a plumber's yeah, trying to, email. yeah. So what? Email, I'll give it to you. So all local law questions are uh, coming to email LL152 of 16 at buildings, the entire word buildings with an S, dot NYC dot gov. Again, that's LL152 of 16 at buildings dot NYC dot gov. Thank you so much for that information. Okay, a um, few more questions, then we're gonna go into the chat. Um, does a property owner need to have an inspection if they have no natural gas service? So in that situation, if they have no natural gas within their property, they're gonna to have to hire a, a design professional, an engineer, or an architect, and they're gonna fill out the GPS two form indicating that there's no gas in, in the building. So you still have to hire somebody licensed just to say that you don't have natural gas. That's correct. So you're still going to have to pay for an inspection. And by the way, you know, obviously there's a cost associated with, with the inspection. I don't want to say what the price is, but, you know, it's there is a cost that the plumbers. I, I'll give a general range, um, $600 to $1,000 right. is a general range for the cost from what um, I've learned. Okay. So that even if you don't have good. natural gas, you're still going to have to pay somebody to file Correct. that uh, GPS too, right? Correct. Okay. Um, how long, and you may have already answered this, but let's just uh, go, you know, make it clear, make it plain. How long should a property owner keep records of reports and certifications? Eight years after the time, eight, eight, eight years after the date of inspection. Make sure you got some good file cabinets. Okay. Um, must a plumber inspect natural gas piping on a roof or in a backyard? Yes. Okay. Only only locations that's exempt is the tenant space, whether that be commercial or residential. That's the only places that they're exempt. Okay. All other locations that have gas must be inspected. Okay, so I got another one. It wasn't on the um, the list that I gave you, but I think this is an important one um, for the faith community. It sounds like uh, all the all the uh, houses of worship are subject to this law. Correct? That is correct. Okay, so you better tell pastor or the imam or the rabbi because you may have a big surprise coming if they don't get this done. Now, from what I've heard. Um, there's already a backup of uh, three to four weeks from the licensed master plumbers. So if they don't get in gear very quickly, uh, the houses of worship, they're going to be in for a big surprise too, as well as, you know, general consumers. So uh, to of the chat, can we go to that are in the chat and and also uh mr butler do we know that mr cornegie join us no he's not here okay okay question from the text message that was sent from mr Busarev from the pub we got a few uh a few months ago national grid had contractors come out and inspect the gas line there was a hundred dollar fee if we didn't do the inspection how does this relate to this law I think you, you went over that earlier. That's local law 30. The 30. Uh, that's local law 30. So it's not connected to this law. 
That and that was uh, being done by National Grid. No, the, the hundred dollar fine. That was the fifteen G zero two four four. Yeah, so it was a different right. So that was a public service commission mandate. It's public service, yeah. Right. Yeah, so and that that, that was. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just. I just want to. I'll repeat this again because some people may have came on a little bit late. Those inspections are being done in Brooklyn by Precision Pipeline Solutions. They were the contractor hired by National Grid to do those inspections that are under the New York State Public Public Service Commission case order number 15-G-0244. And that's okay. where the, the 100, they can charge $100 if you don't give access for that one. Okay, next question. Uh, before Thanks. we go to the next question, uh, and I think it relates to the next question, um, but the filing date, um, since we have a, a deadline of December 31st, does that the first, is that the date of the inspection? The date of the filing, the date of the completion of any work that has to be done. The, the initial filing date should be before on or before December thirty first. So you don't have to have things corrected by then. That's just the initial filing for that one of those. Form, that's the GPS two, right? Correct. Okay. Next question. If corrections are needed. If, if corrections are needed, you get an you get extended time on the corrections up to 180 days. Okay. Is there a petition by city elected officials or court case postponing or suspending the implementation of Local 152, as this will cause financial hardship to a lot of homeowners during during the middle of a pandemic? So um, I we can have, answer that. Or you you want to answer that, Mr. Buck? No, I'm saying we have spoken to Councilman uh, Carnegie about that, um, uh, about pushing forward with that. I would recommend to the public to reach out to their local uh, city council members uh, to make their requests and to send letters and phone calls and everything to the mayor's office. That would be uh, my recommendation. Okay, also, uh, I have personally spoken to the borough president about this, and I think one of his, I think I, I said earlier, and I think he's on uh, the head of land use for the borough president's office. I think uh, Richard Bierak is actually watching this. Um, so we're, we're trying to do our best to make the elected officials aware about the urgency uh, of doing something about this because it's really going to hit a lot of the most vulnerable property owners over the head because they don't even know that this is coming. Those are the senior citizens. Okay. Next, first question from the chat. This person put four questions. Some of these have might already been answered. Are these inspections required for all three plus families, regardless of whether there are tenants? I believe so. Yes, on that, Damaris. Yes. Yeah. Who, perform, who performs the inspection? We answered that. It must be a master plumber. At whose cost? The owner's cost. If there are uh, if there are issues, how long will people have to uh, remediate them? And whether they are are there any financial programs? So I think he has said up to 180 days to remediate the problem. Correct. Okay, are there any financial programs? DOB have any financial programs? DOB does not. Yeah, I just want to drill down on one little point, and that is you have to do your due diligence to make sure that the person is a master licensed plumber, too. And I, I think either right. Damaris or Mr. Jones had mentioned, but it may have just passed right through people, but you have to. To be sure, you need to check on the Department of Buildings website or know somebody that has that capacity to make sure that they're actually a master licensed plumber. Is there a link? Is that information on the DOB website or is there some link to the part? It's on DOB's website. Well, it's, um, yeah, it's our, our buildings information system. Like I mentioned before, you can just type in the plumbing company's name or the plumber's, no, um, uh, the plumber's name and then all that information should come up. If nothing pops up, then they're not licensed. Or it'll show you if the license is expired. Okay. Um, and you can also contact the Better Business Bureau and give the company's name also, and they'll verify also. Better Business Bureau. Better Business Bureau. 
And you can also uh, receive a report card on that individual also. Yes. How do you check to see if your building is in the R3 category? I think we went over that. Um, it's murky. That's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're not sure, you better. You need to get that inspection because you could be facing a ten thousand dollar fine. Right. Uh, next one in the chat is, what about R three A? Is is there an okay. R three A? Let, let me explain this. The 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 what they uh, put in the law confuses a lot of people because they may mix it up with zoning. This right. is not zoning. Okay, so the R3A has to do with uh, what is a use group or what exactly? I don't even remember, but basically it's a one or two family. I think um, rectories, I think they're exempt too. Under 20 people, congregate living. I think there's another group that's also exempt. Can you clarify that, Mr. Jones? If, if that property doesn't classify as an R3, then it's not exempt. If it's not considered to be a one or two family, if, it, if it's being utilized as dormitories, um, uh, as star roles, you know, um, anything outside of a one or two family home, you are required to file. Okay. okay. And, and Mr. Flato, you're correct. The R3A is a zoning. Um, right. Yeah. And that's the use group, so that does not apply. Once you have the R3 listed, you shouldn't have anything to worry about as long as it's indicated as an occupancy classification. No, no but I'm saying in a lot of people's mind, even fairly sophisticated people, they may mix up the R3 or R3A and think it has something to do with zoning. There's no nothing point. to do with zoning. Do not look at the zoning summary. That's exactly what they're going to be looking at. They have to look in the area where it says Department of Finance Building Classification. Right, but if I'm 85 years old and don't have access to the internet, I'm not going to have a clue. Yes, but that's why I mentioned the customer service line. So if you, you know, if you are someone who's elderly and can communicate better over the phone, then you can feel free to call our customer service, and they'll walk you through that. And they'll give you all that information. So the matter is, put the um the deal. I'll put the number in the chat. Can I do that? The number and the site and the uh, website and the building the site. Sure, no problem. Yeah, keep, yeah. Thank you. Um, because somebody said, what is the website? That's why that's the other question. All right, next one. Somebody put, I am confused. I have a three family home with two floors. Does it include homes like that? I guess once yeah, again, it's based yeah, upon, what is it based upon, a CFO or the Department of Finance? What is it based upon? CFO. A three family with two floors is required to file. It's not about how many stories the property is, it's about how many families reside within the property, legally. And, and you, can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Jones, but if there's a discrepancy between the Department of Finance and DOB, it's the DOB records that, that are gonna rule on that. So if the CFO says it's a three family, you have to comply with this. That is correct. Okay, so if the CFO say two family, but the Department of Finance is taxing you as a three family for this local law 152 is based upon the CFO. Correct. Not right, not what the Department of Finance is, is uh, or how they're taxing you. It's based upon the that CFO. So basically what we what basically what we're, we're trying to allow is to utilize the Department of Finance building classification in lieu of the CFO. Because as we all know, most one and two family properties does not have a certificate of occupancy. So to Sorry. avoid anyone, you know, ha having to, to pay this additional money to have a inspection performed, that's not required. That is not, you know, that's not the department's intent. So don't want that to happen. We want. So, we so want I'm going to just repeat a point, Mr. Jones. I'm going to just because some people may have come on late, but the the problem is in Central Brooklyn, there are a lot of buildings that do not have a C of O. And the Department of Finance records may not be accurate either. So, and I, I know personally about some of those situations, and I'm sure some other people on the line do as well. But, but if it, using the Department of Finance records, that might be a fallback, but in a lot of cases, it may not be accurate. So, 
if it's if it's coming up with the Department of Finance as a three, it sounds like you need to do the inspection, even if it's not a three, because otherwise there's a high likelihood that you're going to get a fine. Correct. Correct. Unless you're going to go and do all that research to prove that you're not a three. So basically the CFO rules, but if there is no CFO, it's based upon what the Department of Finance has you categorized as. Let me go to some text, some text message questions now. Uh, what was the name of what you must have from the license inspector or plumber? Um, I guess what is that? What is that supposed? To, I guess once the inspection is, I, I'm assuming it's saying once the inspection is done, what do they have to? What do they get from the master plumber? They're gonna give them a copy of the GPS one form. Say that and again. Check GPS. GPS. GPS one. That stands oh. for gas piping system. Periodic inspection report, GPS-1. Got it. Okay, GPS-1. I placed copies of those in the um, in the chat for people to look at. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Uh, and just back to that person about the three family, but with two floors. If, if your CFO says three family, then yes, we have to do the inspection. If your CFO says two family, then no, you don't have to do the inspection. But if it says three family, then yes. Um, Another text question. What exactly is, is being inspected? The pipeline entering in the building or something else? All of the exposed gas piping. But keep in mind that they're gonna do they're gonna do they're gonna use what's called a gas leak detector also. So it's gonna it's something like a you know a handheld device that has a probe on it that they're going to wand around the pipe and verify if it's a leak also. They're going to be checking for corrosion. They're going to be checking for pipe deterioration. They're going to be checking for illegal connections, um, abnormal operating conditions. They're going to be you know, looking at the appliances to verify that the appliances are installed safely, that you're not getting any, any flue gas spillage or anything of that nature, making sure that necessary controls are installed, things of that nature, making sure that if a pipe is going through a load-bearing wall, or foundation water that has the necessary sleeves on it. We also Got have it. a um, we also have a seven page document of frequently asked questions also. Um, that um, the marriage is it possible that you can um, add the fact sheet um, to the um, chat? Yes, I can add the. I'm gonna. I'm actually adding all the links as we're going along. <laughs> Thank you. No okay, and, we'll and the community out. board, right? I was going to say a community board can repost that, and I guess you can put up my presentation as well, which talks yes. about a few other things besides the local law 152. Next question um, Can an extension for homeowners be granted? We already answered that. What y'all said? There's, 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 no, there's no extension right now, so it's, it's a political matter. We have right. to have this is why we need people on this on this meeting and, and we're going to post this and you need to let the homeowners watch this. And, uh, and people first, people have to be aware that this is about to hit them over the head. So, if there's going to be an extension, it's going to have to come from the city council or pressure from the borough presidents or the mayor. That's yeah. the answer. There's no extension right now. Right. Um, we answer this are two family brownstone homes exempt. Yes. If you're two family. Yes. I'm going to go back over to the chat. Uh, this is a comment and I agree, but this form of notification is horrible. Yes, we know that. So, but let me say this. Um, we didn't know about it. The community board, how we found out about it was that. Uh, people started getting no notices and letters from plumbers about you're going to get fined ten thousand dollars and then and people started calling the community board office you know wondering was this a scam and then as mr flateau you know did most of the research on it and we found out yeah this law exists local law 152 that i say that i did not know anything about it was not brought to my attention Neither until, did we I, started getting until, notices. Few, until about three four weeks ago right so i agree with the comment uh, and all the more reason why, once again, the public, we will do our part in trying to get this um, temporarily um, postponed, but we need the public to do their part also and reaching out to the elected officials. Because the community board, we did not know until people actually started getting notices from plumbers and they started contacting the office. 
And this is a citywide issue. It's going to affect almost 200,000 buildings across New York City. So it's a huge I, issue. And I'm just wondering why CB3 is first up on the list. But that's my question. Well, actually, there are there are four <laughs> community <laughs> boards this year. I, I know, I know, I know. Five. We part, we part of that Five first group, fair. though. Five. We part Five. of that first group. I'm just wondering why. We don't have that many three families in our district. True. Um, you see what I'm saying? We don't have that many three families. Why are we first on the list? But okay. Uh, how can you ex expect homeowners to subscribe to your newsletter? Yeah. Is there a way to subscribe to the newsletter, Damaris? Unfortunately, no, we can't. You can't subscribe. Um, it's just going on our website and looking up every time that we, you know, we issue uh, an update for the building newsletter. Okay. But I will uh, bring so, that back. That recommendation, so, I will bring that yeah, back. Yeah, this this is pretty crazy. So it's like a newsletter with no subscriptions or no people watching it. I know. I understand, and I, I definitely we br will bring that back. <laughs> yes. Next question. I'm trying, we have a lot of questions, so we're trying to get through these. Um, did the marriage say that one and two family homes are exempt? Yes, she did. How about a condo unit, a condo in a three unit building? Yes. That's exempt. No, no they have to comply. Three three Not units exempt. and above, they got to comply. So if it was a Two condos in a two unit building, they don't, but if it's, you know, in a three unit building, they have to apply or else pay the $10,000 fine. Okay. How can I get the recording? I apologize. I have to commute now. Somebody got to get on the train or the bus to go home. Thank you for this vital information. Just um, if they're still listening, well, we're going to have this posted on the um, community board's website and Facebook page um, tomorrow, the presentation, and, and, and this recording. We will try to um, e-blast this out, the, um, the recording of this meeting, of this town hall. So we'll try to uh, get as much information out as possible about this. As far as I know, we're the first community board to do this citywide, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to the text messages now. Uh, how do we know if their cost is reasonable? Um, I, I, I mean, gave a range. I gave a range for what I've heard. Right, that's that's what I've heard. Shop around if you can. Shop but around you, and make sure that they're licensed. What you hearing, Damaris or Mister Mister Um Sean? What are you hearing? You the master plumber? What you hearing? That that must be just for two, uh, three families, three to four families. What I'm for, for six six hundred to a thousand. I'm hearing I'm hearing a lot of different numbers. I'm hearing it range anywhere from six hundred dollars to six thousand dollars. Six hundred to a thousand dollars is the range. No, he said he's heard six hundred to six thousand. So, whoa, that's whoa. The people. That's that's like the the uh, the shell game, man. That's when you. You got you got took if you got charged that's six thousand. <laughs> that's happening in larger buildings also. So if you are just talking about the universe of anywhere between three to six families, the six hundred to thousand dollars is what I'm hearing. But the six thousand dollar range goes for larger buildings. Just keep in mind that that fee for the inspection does not cover the cost of the repairs if necessary. Right. It doesn't cover the cost of obtaining permits. And you know the the the, the labor that the uh, plumber has to perform in order to bring the the, the system into compliance. Okay, let's let's repeat that. That cost covers the inspection and the plumber with the the, the, the licenses. Uh, the, you the said covers inspection only. Does not cover any repairs. And I just want to repeat a, a point that I made earlier. The plumbers are backed up, so there's about a three or four week delay. And we're going to be going into Thanksgiving soon. So if you don't have something lined up soon, you, you, there's a good possibility you could get jammed on this thing. Right. Also, keep in mind, there's over 2,500 licensed master plumbers in the city. Uh, and from my understanding, anywhere between 500 to 600 of those companies are performing these inspections. There okay. is. There's a, there's a, there's a there's a pool of them out there. You just have to you just have to do your research, unfortunately. And the department we're not we're not privy to provide a license, you know, companies to perform this work. 
not all plumbers are taking on the responsibility because there is a liability factor associated with this. So you just have to, you know, research and, and, and shop around to try to, you know, get some, to, get, to get the help that you need in regards to performing these inspections. There is a trade organization called Last Licensed Master Plumber Council um, that has listed yeah. all of the licensed master plumbers. Then from there, you can you can check them out to be sure that they're legit. But they have hundreds Absolutely. listed. If they okay. have, if the master plumber council have them listed, then they're legitimate plumbing companies. The master, I work with them on a day to day basis. They're they're an organization that the plumbers are associated with, um, and they will even if you're not a member of the organization, they're still going to list them because they want people to you know utilize the right people. They don't want you hiring a neighborhood handyman to perform this type of inspection or perform any gas related work. Okay. Uh, please explain further. The master licensed plumber uses GPS tool to state if we have or are using natural gas or not. Correct. The question. It, it states it. It indicates so the GPS tool form is, is for both. It's for whether or not the building has gas or if it doesn't have gas. The GPS tool form is just a certification that your inspection was actually performed. So let me just clarify something. If you have the form, if you're looking at it, it's line four. If you don't have natural gas, they would check that box. I certify that the above building contains no gas piping system. And that can only be certified by a design professional, a licensed, uh, a registered architect, architect or a licensed uh, engineer. Right. So you got to pay that 600 to to $1,000, even somebody. if you don't have the natural gas. <laughs> to somebody. Okay. I have a question that came in to me, um, and that is, we had heard from one plumber that uh, the plumber who does the inspection uh, cannot be the same plumber that does the repairs. Is that true, that's or can true. that's not true? Okay. Okay. We prefer it because what's going to end up happening is the plumber that does the inspection after the after the repairs are made, he has to he has to submit he has to close out his inspection. So when he some initially submits it. It's going to indicate that it's conditions that was observed. Those conditions can be resolved until either, either you know, another plumber comes in or that plumber goes in and fix the conditions under a under a required permit. You know, perform, you know, do 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 his due diligence. If another plumber is performing those performing the repairs, I'm sure there's going to be a lack of communication, and more than likely. That 180 day time frame might elapse, and now the homeowner is subject to a violation of a $10,000 fine for not closing out the loop. So I, I strongly recommend, but this is just a recommendation, that you utilize the same plumber that is inspection to close out the, um, to, to make the necessary repairs. Now, that might not always be the case because the price might be a little higher than what you anticipate on paying. You have every right to utilize another plumber, but the line of communication has to be sound. You have, as you as the property owner, have that responsibility to make sure that once those repairs are made, that information is now transferred to the initial plumber that did the inspection so he can close his loop. Oh, and a lot of, got it, got it. A lot of, lot of plumbers, they don't want to come behind what somebody else inspected or did, so. So his, the recommendation is use the same plumber that did the inspection. That's the recommendation. Right. So How it's just the opposite it... of what they told you, Ms. Ben. Well, actually, no, what he's saying, it's, it's not required. But if you if you get someone else to do the work, the initial plumber who does the inspection has to close it out. So he right. has to come back anyway. You've got to communicate. Right. How long does a typical inspection take? Depends on the size of the building. It depends. Okay, depends on the size of the building. I'm going over to the chat now. Um, what is the timeline for compliance? I think we answered that December 31st. Right. Um, right. I have a fourth family. Do I get exempt from this? No. If your CFO says fourth family, no, you, you have to comply. What is the fees for this? I'm getting lots of different pricing. We said between 600 to 1,000. Um, if you have a you know three, four family home, between 600 to 1,000, but you've got to do your homework. 
um, you know, check a bunch of different master plumbers pricing. Um, how do we how do we request an extension on the December thirty first deadline? Homeowners need more time to plan for this additional expense. Yes, we know. Yes, we know. At at this point, Demaris, there is no way of, of requesting for an extension, right? No, not right now. Okay. No extension. Something we have to work on. Um. Get as many yes. people as you can to watch this video so that they're informed and we need to contact our elected officials. We need as much support on this as we can get. Okay, we answered this one about two families. Are two families exempt? Yes, and three families, three families in scope. I don't know what they mean by three families in scope. I don't know what they mean, but if it's a seal, your CFO says three family, then you're not exempt. You have to get the ins inspection. Um what is a b1 I don't that's know what a that two means. family according to the department of finance what is it it's a two family according to the department of finance okay so if, you're b, so if you're b1 you don't have to do the inspect you don't have to worry about this as long as the department of buildings doesn't have a cfo that says it's a three Something which right. happens sometimes sometimes there's a discrepancy between finance and buildings if there's so, a discrepancy some, then buildings rules whatever Right. The buildings department said would rule in this case. Okay, right. somebody said thank you, Miss Penn. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> in the chat. Okay, and then somebody said, "What is wrong with DOB? Why can't you notify homeowners directly?" That's in the chat and in the um, in the um text message. That is a good question, Demarius. So y'all have you guys have the list of. <clears throat> Um, um, properties that are three families and up in each district. How come there wasn't any direct um, communication? I just don't think that we have uh, direct communications for all buildings that that maybe requires this inspection. Not as of yet. Um, you know, I can see if that's something that they're working on and find out um, because that is something I think that the department is trying to head towards, at least to be a little bit more transparent with the public and make it easier for them to do these inspections and these sorts of things for the homeowners. Um, so I can get back to you and find out if there's anything kind of uh, in the in the pipeline for that. And um, I asked that because, for example, with National Grid, when they were doing theirs, you know, uh, off time, it is doing anything um, like when they were changing the meters, you know, we were getting you get direct contact uh, right, from right. those utility companies and i'm just surprised that no i will make it easier not do that. you know so right. actually just let me and i misspoke before so i actually just went on our website and this has actually been recently updated so you can subscribe to the newsletter i'm putting it in the chat in the link, the link. okay thank you so you so okay. you can c-a-n yeah. subscribe to the newsletter i just put it in there okay. Okay, so I'm going to read this next one. I think this is where people get confused because they're, they're getting confused with how many stories a building is. We are one family living in a three family house, one two bedroom apartment, one studio, and an owner's duplex with two bedrooms. That's six people all together. I guess the question once again if the CFO says three family, then yes, you have to do it. It's three family. If yeah, if it, if your CFO says three, you can have three floors, but you know, be a two, it's still a two family. Um, but it says a three family house. So if you people check your CFO certificate of occupancy, check that. If that does not exist, then it's um, what Department of Finance has you labeled as. Next question. Oh, then it, oh, that's continue with that. What if the work to be done goes past the deadline? What if the work needs to be done? So I guess if they get the inspection December 28th and then some work has to be done and then the plumber can't do the work and you know, going into the new year, obviously with the holidays and everything, um, they're not getting fined ten thousand dollars, correct? No, because you're not 180, <laughs> no, no. 180 days after the time of the initial inspection to make all necessary repairs. 180 days after the date of initial inspection. Correct. And okay. that's on the service notice as well, all that information. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't hear that, you have 180 days to correct any, to make any um, corrections. 180 up to, days up after, to. 
up to 180 days, up to 180 days to make corrections after the inspection, after the inspection, up to 180 days. Um, all right, I think that's it for the text messages right now. Over back to the chat. So how do we know that your records are up to date, meaning the Department of Buildings? I'm just reading the questions. <laughs> I'm just reading the questions. I don't know what where is this mean. I don't know what that means. They're up to date. They're up to date. As you stated, there might be a few. There's, there's some documents, a lot of documents off site, um, but they're available. And the next question I already answered. The, well, I asked that question. Why can't the DOB send a letter to properties that are that are not R three? Uh, next question. Is the Department of Buildings even open during COVID? Yes. Our, yes. our customer service counters are open until 2, two. they open mm -hmm. up at 8.30 and they close at 2 o'clock every day. Okay. I'm just going to read some comments because I guess I need for y'all to understand the frustration of people. So one comment. How Who dare DOB find homeowners without know. notice or outreach? Um, is there a list of certified companies? I guess it's my plumbers. We've talked about that where they can find a, a list of master plumbers. Uh, HPD online would show a MDR number if it was a three family or more. Yet another potential source for confusion. But what what rules would be what the the buildings department says? That's the most important thing. If right. there's any all, record in the buildings department, this is all about department of buildings. You can also utilize. I forgot about that, but you can also use, utilize the HPD system. Also, their records are generally accurate as well. The ICON system. Okay. Uh, there, somebody there, asked. I, I just got to unpack that. He just mentioned something. Probably ninety nine percent of people don't know what he just said. He said an I card. Yeah, I card. It, it, That's an information it, 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 card that H. Exactly. It, it was a, a, the initial. I think it was buildings department, which later became or housing department, which later became HPD. They used to send people out like 80 years ago to gather information. They put it on index cards. And they call that an I card. So you could go to HPD's website. Some properties have an I card um, that's there. But for the average consumer, they're not going to know anything about that. All right. But if you are a three above uh, with HPD, um, you should be should be listed with a property registration. That is correct because it will not show a one or two family. If you put your address right. in and there's no property registration listed, then you'll be glad you that you can consider yourself to be a one or two family typically. Okay, next question. Where on the property profile overview for the New York City Department of Building does it indicate whether your property is two family or three or more? It's right next to it should say Department of Finance. Um building classification it should say it there. Okay. Now, I think they were asking about the property profile on the buildings department website. There's actually there's a link they they have for a certificate of occupancy there, so you can click on that link. It may be you click on that link and it says there are no certificates of occupancy, or if there is one, you just click on that link and it'll it'll show it. That's on the buildings department website. But but they do list um, multiple uh, buildings, uh, even if they um, do not have a certificate of occupancy. So if they're three and above. If you're in the biz system, if you're in the biz system, you're three and above because they don't usually list uh, um, private properties. No, um, that's not so at all. Biz list everything, biz list all properties. The HPD okay. iCloud system doesn't list one or two family dwellings. So, just to clarify, biz, that's the buildings information system that's on the buildings department website when he said biz system. Yes, it's right above where the complaints and the violations and the job filings, all that, it's right above there. It's like a little line. 
Okay, next question. New lines were just installed on our block. Do we still have to get the inspection? I don't know what they mean by new lines. That's probably it's under that PSC, man. That's probably local law 30. It's probably local law 30. Say that again, Mr. Jones. Local law 152 is totally different from the pipeline inspection. So therefore, they still require to comply. Got it. Right they could point. have been putting a valve outside or, you know, that's nothing to do with um, local law 150. Well, a new service type and just as well, but again, that has nothing to do with the department of buildings. We don't, we don't know that. Got it. Got it. All right. Somebody wrote, can that part about the areas that are not being entered for inspection, please be written out here. I know you have mentioned something, Mr. Jones, about um, plumbers trying to get um do more work than has to be done are there certain uh, things that 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 does not go with the local 152 that plumbers don't need to be inspecting within the household and they're not required to enter within the tenant space so if you have a, if you have a three-family building the plumber should not be entering into anyone's particular apartment if you have a if you have a a 25-story commercial building the plumber should not be intimate into any tenant's space on e in, on any said floor. They are only required to enter mechanical rooms, boiler rooms, you know, any other room that houses gas piping as long as it is outside of the tenant space. If a mechanical room is within a tenant space, they cannot go in there and perform an inspection. They are required to stop at that tenant's door and check for a gas leak around that area right there. They shall not enter a tenant space. No matter what the occupancy group is, what type of occupancy it is, commercial, residential, it doesn't matter. The local law clearly states no tenant spaces. So no tenant spaces. No tenant spaces. If your building has gas meters installed within the apartment, if your gas meters are installed within the apartment, the plumber shall not be intimate into the tenant space to look at that gas meter. He is only required to look at the piping in the exposed areas. At the lowest level and on, the, on, on all floors, if that's the case. Got it. Just to emphasize just all to floors, just because to note, the fact sheet, the fact sheet that I just spoke of, it answers majority of these questions that's being asked right now. Okay, I'll get that from the mass. We, we will get that out. Right. Yeah, so I, put I just, that out, please. I, I, I highly, uh, you know, I, I, I ask that you assist with putting that out because the information needs to get out there. And I just wanted to emphasize that not the tenant space and public space, because with a lot of brownstones, with the conversion from from, um, from with, with the conversion, very often gas lines are running through the hallways, and so that's yeah, I hope public not. space. I hope not. Oh, they, they, yeah, that happens. Gas pipeline is not allowed to be installed in the public corridor, so that's mm -hmm. a violation in condition in itself. That would be an abnormal operating condition would require now that pipe system to be replaced. All right, stop telling on people, Ms. Penn. Okay, next question. This is a good question. How are these plumbers being regulated? They are somebody feels they are taking advantage of the law and attempting to overcharge. So again, if you if that's the case. You can report the plumber to our special investigation unit. And that telephone number is 212-825-2413. Repeat it again, please, for the people on the phone. 212-825-2413. And Damaris, can you put it in the chat? Yes, I'll do that now. Yeah, uh, any, any any illegal or, or suspicious activity that you might deem on the part of the, uh, of the license contractor, by all means, you can report them to that to that to that to that agency, and they'll start an investigation on them. And also, I recommend if that's happening, you report them to the Better Business Bureau also. Okay. The Better um, Business Bureau report card on all licensed master plumbers in New York City. So, you know, if they start getting bad reports, then, you know, that'll, that'll teach them a lesson one way or another. Got it. 
I just want to well, everybody know we go, we're definitely going to go to go past 730. We've already we already passed 730. I want to get through these questions uh, and comments. I had a public service inspection by pipeline already. And they did not enter any tenant apartments. Yeah, I guess that's like more of a comment. Um, does the boiler room have to be covered in sheet metal? The boiler room has, if it's an enclosed boiler room, has to have the appropriate fire rating. Okay. If sheet metal, it can be sheet metal. If, that's, if that sheet metal is required to our fire rating, it can be sheet rock, it can be fire fire blocks. It, it varies. But we don't want any, we don't want any openings from within the boiler room. So if, if you have any, uh, any, um, any holes in the wall or anything like that, or the, the, the ceiling is not the, 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 the uh, wall doesn't go all the way up to the ceiling that's a fire hazard we don't want that so that has to be that has to be taken care of okay um somebody asked if you have been inspected and cleared why must it be done every four years because things happen over a period of time and that's the law that's the way the law was written you have to have periodic inspections Okay, I'm just catching up. Some of these questions are from about a half an hour ago. We've answered some of these. So I said, thank you. I was one. I was wondering if houses of worship were included. Somebody's um, about the list of master plumbers. We answered that. People who are reputable, we answered that. Um, is it only for properties classified as R threes only? Then we answer R threes and 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 up. Correct. No, anything no. outside of an R three. Say that again. Anything outside of an R three. Anything outside of an R three. Because they say they joined late. So anything outside of an R three to the person must comply. Must comply. Must comply. Anything outside. Can the one eighty grace period be remediated? Go into 2021 without a fine to remediate going to 2021 no. without a fine. If if you file your if you file your inspection and your inspection initial date is December 20th, you have until June 20th to correct all conditions. June 20th. Right. You have to file that first report before December 31st, though. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. Uh, will DOB do any further notifications to homeowners other than the methods previously mentioned as those methods have not been effective? What? Did you repeat that? It's you said, will the DOB do any further notification to homeowners oh, other than the methods previously mentioned as those methods have not been effective? It's just hard for us to determine which houses and have gas piping or not. So it's it's hard to really you know target people that may need this, may not need this, that's the only thing. So it, it becomes a little bit difficult. And I think, like I said, they're working on it. Okay. What if a, it's a three family house, but one family lives in the house. You gotta get it done. Doesn't matter how many people are living there. Okay, I see stuff from Damaris. Please repeat what areas have to be inspected and is there some place where we can find it in writing? Yes, it's in the body of the, it's in the local law, it's in the rule, and it's in the fact sheet. We'll, we'll have that on our website as well. Mm -hmm. I put that in the chat as well. It's there. I can post it again. Yeah, if the person that's, um, yeah, if you can look, if you go into the chat, um, she has a whole bunch of links in there with the information. Um, what are some of the anticipated things that would require remediation? How are we sure we are not going to be taken advantage of? I don't know how to answer that one. There is a long list of things that can be that might need remediation. Abnormal conditions again, most of those things are listed in the local law, and you can also reach out uh, also, um. Yeah, it's pretty much all spread on the local law as well as the fact sheet. 
So things like a gas leak, if you got one parts, if something was um, right. Un right. Un unsafe conditions, <laughs> right? If and if some piping it. was done to cold, there's there's a whole okay. list of things. You have a gas. You have a gas pipe that has an open end, that meaning that it's not connected to anything. So if someone was to open the valve, the gas is dispersed out into the space. There's, there's a whole there's a laundry list of things that I don't think we have enough time to actually spill out individually, okay. but it, it's listed inside the local law get, as well as the rules. So let me get to these other these rest of these questions. I don't seem to have a C of O of my house for my house, but I believe my house is considered three family. Though it's only two units, where on the Department of Finance website can I find the designation? You don't want to do Department of Finance, huh? Check, do you that, want to check the CD system? I didn't hear that. What, what did y'all say? Check the HPD system, or they can check when they get that yearly. Um, it's on a tax oh. bill. So it's not it's not yeah. on a, is it on a tax it, bill? It's on a tax bill, yes. The finance yeah. classification is on your tax bill. It tells yeah. you how many families you have on your tax bill. But that may not be the that may not be No, the, no, but he was asking where could you find it on the department, you know, the Department of Finance. Department of finance site. It's it's That's either the on their site or you could you could look on your tax bill. But they're saying they don't have a C of O, but they, they think they have a three family. Right. Okay. Comments. Comments. A plumber working under a master plumber can do the inspection. That's the question. Yes, he has to have a dash work qualification. He must provide, he must have a minimum of five years experience and he has to show proof of such by having a, a full dash work qualification. Uh, next, second part of the question: Does the master plumber have to be present during the inspection? No, he can have his authorized representative perform the inspection. Okay. Question: Can Sean come do mine? <laughs> <laughs> that was for you, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Maybe you can put another two years, and I leave DOB. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, this is a good question. Why would a one to two family who uses gas be exempt? Why are you why are one to two families <laughs> exempt? I Not that we want to be included, but why are we why are they exempt? I actually counsel the same thing. I have the slightest idea why they're exempt. I guess to avoid the hardship on the own property owned. I'm not sure. I, I'm 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 just as puzzled with that as as, as anyone else. Oh, that's interesting. Let's okay. not suggest that to uh, the city council. Bro. Yeah, don't take that one back. <laughs> um, what about the recent construction on the gas lines? How does that mess with compliance? But once again, it's not the outside. We're talking about inside, inside your house. So let's also keep in mind, even if you just had a permit to repack your entire building, you just got a permit in the beginning of this year, and you finished that work today. You were still required to have that gas work. You still required to have that inspection performed. The only other exemption outside of the R3 is a new building that's being constructed that received their TCO on or after the initial date of your filing cycle. So let's say if you have a building and you just received your TCO on January 3rd, then you're not required to file your your first inspection doesn't have to be done until 10 years from January 3rd. Now, if you did a complete alteration, you did a, you took every single thing out of your building. It's the only thing that's there is just a shell. And you just be putting everything and you finally got your, you, you just got your, um, all your inspection, your job is now signed off. You receive your letter of completion. You got a new certificate of occupancy, so forth and so on. You are still required to file because that building is not classified as a new building. It is an alteration that took place in that building. Okay, God, we're almost to the end. It was stated that the master plumber did not need access to tenants' apartments, 
but the rep from DOB just stated that appliances have to be inspected. Please clarify. Appliances that's outside of the tenant space. So if you have a bar mechanical room on a floor, if you have a mechanical room on a floor outside of the tenant space, that is just a room designated for your boiler and hot water heat or your HVAC unit, and it's within the public corridor, it's in a closet within the public corridor, that must be inspected. Now, if, if your tenant space has a boiler, a hot water heater, a, a, a fireplace, a stove, a dryer, so forth and so on, you cannot go into that tenant space to perform that inspection. That tenant space is exempt. But all, 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 all essential areas within the building that's governed and, 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 and overseen by the property owner, those must be inspected. So that means any pipe that you have on the roof, any pipe that you have in the backyard, any pipe that you have in the cellar, any pipe on each individual floor, no matter where the piping system is at, that system must be inspected with the exception of the tenant space. Okay. So boilers in the basement where you have to enter into an apartment is off limits. Yeah. Boilers in the basement when you have that sounds like an illegal occupancy to me. <laughs> you got a whole nother problem if you got an apartment in the cellar. Oh and I I might, you might be shutting down the, the building then. I think that's why one or two families were actually exempt because of that whole illegal occupancy problem that would have put people at a whole nother level of hardship. We have been displacing a lot of people while these inspections are being performed. So I think that's one of the other reasons why this is being done the way it is. Um, how do you go about correcting a multifamily when you are a two-family brownstone? Uh, I don't know. There's no easy is. solution to that. You would have to get a new CFO or get a, you know, it's, it's not going to happen between now and December 31st. It's not going to happen. Are they talking about? Because he said I, I have only two gas meters, but I think my records say differently. So if you're trying to correct your CFO, that's not something that you're going to do between now and December 31st. If you have a CFO, which you think is incorrect. Okay. Um. That is. Let me see. One last one. We have to wrap this up. So just confirming that it sounds like the inspector will look at the gas lines in the owner's apartment. Is that no. correct? Incorrect. Or incorrect. Correct. That is, that is no apartment. It, the owner, the owner's son, whomever, no inspections are required to be performed within any tenant space. Right, nothing in the tenant space. The owner, the owner will be deemed, if the owner owns an apartment, that's considered to be tenant space. Oh, okay. Got it. If the, if the owner's apartment, that's considered tenant space. Okay. All right. I think that's it. I'm going to check the any last minute text messages. <laughs> um, so, no, no last minute text messages. That's it for the chat part. Um, so, yeah. So, I'm. He spoke to Councilman Carnegie. He's supposed to be trying to do something with the community board in another two weeks. Um, we, we're definitely doing another one in another two weeks. And um, Damaris and Sean, um, we, we uh, need to have you guys back on. I uh, will um, shoot some dates over again to you. Um, hopefully, we'll have the councilman on, on that call as well. And he can deal with the political aspect of, of the extension part or trying to get, to get this delayed. But we want... Um, you and Sean on uh, to further educate our district about this local law uh, 152. I hope that people um, learn something from this tonight and please, you know, spread the word to your neighbors. Uh, Mr. Flateau. 
just want to uh, you and uh, Mr. Busareth, Ms. Penn, uh, for all your insightful comments. Uh, we're going to be posting this on uh, and on the website. Please let your neighbors know about this. There's a huge uh, $10,000 penalty for noncompliance. As Mr. Butler pointed out, we're going to do everything we can in terms of the uh, the political side. Uh, I've talked personally to the borough president about this. He had a representative, I think, that was on this um, meeting, and we're in close contact with Council Member Cornegy. So um, I don't have anything else. Um, so uh, good night and God bless. And thank you, thank you, Sean, and thank you, Damaris. Any last minute thing you guys want to say? Thank you. Thank you for having us. We're happy to be here. Um, I can't post the actual PDF uh, for the fact sheet onto the chat, so I'm just going to send it to you via email so you can put it on your website. Yeah, just, yeah, just email it to me. We'll get it out. Okay. Okay, so we're talking, and once again, as Mr. Flato said, thank you to everyone for coming on, and please spread the word. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night. All right, thank you, Sean. Really appreciate it.